Disclaimer. The following audiobook presentation of Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia is intended for educational and informational purposes only. This is a non-commercial project by DisinfoZone aimed at disseminating this seminal work to a new audience interested in ufology. We assert that this falls under fair use under United States copyright law, serving the public interest without affecting the market for the original work. We highly recommend purchasing a copy of this book, as well as other works by Jacques Vallée, to support his invaluable contributions to the field. Visuals in this presentation are produced by Static Void Studio, to whom we are deeply indebted. To Magonia, and back. The mind of a person coming out of fairyland is usually blank as to what has been seen and done there. Walter Wentz, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. The mind of private first class Jerry Irwin was blank when he woke up on March 2, 1959, in Cedar City Hospital. He had been unconscious for 23 hours, at times mumbling incoherently something about a jacket on the bush. When he became conscious, his first question was, were there any survivors? The story of Private Irwin is a mysterious one, and very little has been done to clarify it. It has been mentioned only once in UFO literature by James Lorenzen, director of the APRO group, and has not, to the best of my knowledge, been the subject of subsequent investigation. Such an investigation, however, would throw light on some aspects of the UFO problem now gaining considerable publicity and causing some concern to those who follow the development of the sociological context of UFO reports. Perhaps, as Lorenzen suggests, there was a military investigation that has been kept secret. If so, secrecy on the part of the authorities, if they are really concerned with the nation's peace of mind, is not the best course, as the following review of the few well-established facts of the Irwin case which serves as an introduction to a discussion of the problem of contact, makes clear. Late on February 28, 1959, Jerry Irwin, a Nike missile technician, was driving from Nampa, Idaho, back to his barracks at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. He was returning from military leave. He had reached Cedar City, Utah, and turned southeast on Route 14, when he observed an unusual phenomenon six miles after the turnoff. The landscape brightened and a glowing object crossed the sky from right to left. Irwin stopped the car and got out. He had time to watch the object as it continued in an easterly direction until hidden from view by a ridge. The witness decided that he might have seen an airliner on fire attempting a forced landing, in which case there was no time to lose. Consequently, instead of resuming his journey, Irwin wrote a note. Have gone to investigate possible plane crash. Please call law enforcement officers. And placed it on the steering wheel of his car. Using shoe polish, he wrote stop on the side of his car to make sure people would find his note, and then started out on foot. Approximately 30 minutes later, a fish and game inspector did stop. He took the note to the Cedar City Sheriff, Otto Fief, who gathered a party of volunteers and returned to the site. Ninety minutes after he had sighted the strange object, Jerry Irwin was discovered unconscious and taken to the hospital. No trace of an airplane crash was found. At the hospital, Dr. Broadbent observed that Irwin's temperature and respiration were normal. He seemed merely to be asleep, but he could not be awakened. Dr. Broadbent diagnosed hysteria. Then, when Irwin did wake up, he felt fine, although he was still puzzled by the object he had seen. He was also puzzled by the disappearance of his jacket. He was assured that he was not wearing it when he was found by the search party. Irwin was flown back to Fort Bliss and placed under observation at William Beaumont Army Hospital for four days, after which period he returned to duty. His security clearance, however, was revoked. Several days later, Irwin fainted while walking in the camp, but he recovered rapidly. Several days afterward, on Sunday, March 15th, he fainted again in an El Paso street and was taken to Southwest General Hospital. There, his physical condition was found similar to that observed in Cedar City. He woke up about 2 a.m. on Monday and asked, were there any survivors? He was told that the date was not February 28th, but March 16th. 
Once more, he was taken to William Beaumont Hospital and placed under observation by psychiatrists. He remained there over one month. Lawrenson reports that, according to a Captain Valentine, the results of the tests indicated that he was normal. He was discharged on April 17th. The next day, following an unidentifiable but very powerful urge, he left the fort without leave, caught a bus in El Paso, arrived in Cedar City Sunday afternoon, April 19th, walked to the spot where he had seen the object, left the road, and went back through the hills, right to a bush where his jacket lay. There was a pencil in a buttonhole with a piece of paper wound tightly around it. He took the paper and burned it. Then he seemed to come out of a trance. He had to look for the road. Not understanding why he had come there, he turned himself in and thus met Sheriff Otto Fief, who gave him the details of the first incident. The Lorenzans contacted Irwin after he had returned to Fort Bliss and undergone a new psychological examination as futile as the previous one. His case came to the attention of the Inspector General, who ordered a new examination. On July 10th, Irwin re-entered William Beaumont Army Hospital. On August 1st, he failed to report for duty. One month later, he was listed as a deserter. He was never seen again. New Hampshire revisited. The Irwin case is reminiscent of another incident that has become one of the standards of modern American folklore. The report by Betty and Barney Hill and their examination under hypnosis by Dr. Benjamin Simon, which has been documented at length by John Fuller in his excellent book, The Interrupted Journey. The reader must carry in mind the main features of the Irwin and Hill cases in order to follow the discussion that is the object of the present chapter. So those already familiar with the cases must forgive me if I repeat what is already well known to them. But in so doing, I hope some observations will come to light that have not previously been published. Report number 100-1-61, in the files of the 100th Bomb Wing, Strategic Air Command, Pease Air Force Base, New Hampshire, was prepared by Major Paul W. Henderson. The only official document concerning the Hill case, it apparently has never before been published. Yet it contains a detail of which both Dr. Simon and John Fuller were unaware the object seen by the hills had been detected by military radar. Quote, During a casual conversation on the 22nd of September 1961 between Major Gardner B. Reynolds, 100th BWDC-01, and Captain Robert O. Doherday, Commander 1917-2 AACS DIT, Pease Air Force Base, New Hampshire, it was revealed that a strange incident occurred at 0214 local on the 20th of September. No importance was attached to the incident at the time. Subsequent interrogation failed to bring out any information in addition to the extract of the Daily Report of Controller, end quote. The visual sighting itself is summarized as follows, quote, On the night of 19 to the 20th of September between zero dark and 0100, Mr. and Mrs. Hill were traveling south on Route 3 near Lincoln, New Hampshire when they observed, through the windshield of their car, a strange object in the sky. They noticed it because of its shape and the intensity of its lighting as compared to the stars in the sky. The weather and sky was clear at the time, end quote. In the report itself, under paragraph E, location and details, we read Betty Hill's account of the sighting as reported by Pease Air Force Base officials. Quote, the observers were traveling by car in a southerly direction on Route 3 south of Lincoln, New Hampshire, when they noticed a brightly lighted object ahead of their car at an angle of elevation of approximately 45 degrees. It appeared strange to them because of its shape and the intensity of its lights compared to the stars in the sky. Weather and sky were clear. They continued to observe the object from their moving car for a few minutes, then stopped. After stopping the car, they used binoculars at times. They report that the object was traveling north very fast. They report it changed directions rather abruptly and then headed south. Shortly thereafter, it stopped and hovered in the air. There was no sound evident up to this time. Both observers used the binoculars at this point. While hovering, objects began to appear from the body of the object, which they describe as looking like wings, which made a V-shape then extended. The wings had red lights on the tips. At this point, they observed it to appear to swoop down in the general direction of their auto. The object continued to descend until it appeared to be only a matter of hundreds of feet above their car. 
At this point, they decided to get out of that area, and fast. Mr. Hill was driving, and Mrs. Hill watched the object by sticking her head out of the window. It departed in a generally northwesterly direction, but Mrs. Hill was prevented from observing its full departure by her position in the car. They report that while the object was above them after it had swooped down, they heard a series of short, loud buzzes, which they described as sounding like someone had dropped a tuning fork. They report that they could feel these buzzing sounds in their auto. No further visual observations were made of this object. They continued on their trip, and when they arrived in the vicinity of Ashland, New Hampshire, about 30 miles from Lincoln, they again heard the buzzing sound of the object. However, they did not see it at this time. Mrs. Hill reported the flight pattern of the object to be erratic, changed directions rapidly, that during its flight it ascended and descended numerous times very rapidly. Its flight was described as jerky and not smooth. Mr. Hill is a civil service employee in the Boston Post Office and doesn't possess any technical or scientific training. Neither does his wife. During a later conversation with Mr. Hill, he volunteered the observation that he did not originally intend to report this incident, but inasmuch as he and his wife did in fact see this occurrence, he decided to report it. He says that on looking back he feels that the whole thing is incredible, and he feels somewhat foolish. He just cannot believe that such a thing could or did happen. He says on the other hand that they both saw what they reported, and this fact gives it some degree of reality. Information contained herein was collected by means of telephone conversation between the observers and the preparing individual. The reliability of the observer cannot be judged, and while his apparent honesty and seriousness appears to be valid, it cannot be judged at this time." End quote. This report is remarkable for what it does not contain. In this respect, it is probably typical of a large class of Air Force records, most of those involving close proximity to a UFO, where either witness reluctance or lack of adequate follow-up eliminated the most significant information. In the present case, the witnesses failed to give the Air Force any information as to the beings they could see aboard the craft during their observation with binoculars, and proper investigation would have disclosed an element of which they were not immediately aware. They could not account for a time gap of two hours between the two periods of buzzing sounds. In fact, they could not recall how they had driven the 35 miles between Indian Head and Ashland so casually mentioned in the Air Force report. What happened after their story became known is well documented in John Fuller's book. Both witnesses had a series of strange nightmares. The dreams led them to see a psychiatrist who used hypnosis to discover the root of the problem. And it was only then found that the origin of the nightmares could be traced to those missing two hours. Under separate hypnosis, Betty and Barney Hill said they had been taken by the strange beings into the UFO. I have been privileged to hear the portion of the tapes covering the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Further discussion with the witnesses and with Dr. Simon and John Fuller leads me to regard the case not as an individual event to be investigated and treated as such, but on the contrary, as an indication of a general pattern that cannot be separated from the total phenomenon. First, it is interesting to note that, as further details came to the Hill's memories after treatment, the case took on more of the features present in other UFO landings of which the Hills could not have heard. One such detail is the recollection by Betty Hill that, after their car was stopped and a group of men had come toward them, the creatures had opened the door of the vehicle and pointed a small device at her. When I asked her to what usual object she could compare it, she told me, it could have been a pencil. It is not necessary to repeat the descriptions given by the Hills of the manner in which they were abducted or of the conditions inside the object. It is enough to say that the statements made under hypnosis by Betty and Barney are in general agreement. And it is also useful to study the detailed accounts of the entities given by the witnesses. Betty states, quote, Most of the men are my height. None is as tall as Barney, so I would judge them to be five feet to five feet four inches. Their chests are larger than ours. Their noses were larger longer than the average size, although I have seen people with noses like theirs, like Jimmy Durante. Their complexions were of a grey tone, like a grey paint with a black base. Their lips were of a bluish tint. Hair and eyes were very dark, possibly black. 
In a sense, they looked like mongoloids. This sort of round face and broad forehead, along with a certain type of coarseness. The surface of their skin seemed to be a bluish grey, but probably whiter than that. Their eyes moved, and they had pupils. Somehow I had the feeling they were more like cat's eyes. End quote. Barney, on the other hand, says this, quote, The men had rather odd-shaped heads, with a large cranium, diminishing in size as it got toward the chin, and the eyes continued around to the sides of their heads, so that it appeared that they could see several degrees beyond the lateral extent of our vision. This was startling to me. The mouth was much like when you draw one horizontal line with a short perpendicular line on each end. This horizontal line would represent the lips without the muscle that we have, and it would part slightly as they made this mumu mumming sound. The texture of the skin, as I remember it from this quick glance, was greyish, almost metallic looking. I didn't notice any hair, or headgear for that matter. I didn't notice any proboscis. There just seemed to be two slits that represented the nostrils, end quote. There are some obvious contradictions between the two descriptions. Betty speaks of very dark hair. Barney did not notice any. The men described by Barney do not exactly evoke in my mind the picture of Jimmy Durante. On the other hand, the creatures are strikingly reminiscent of the UFO operators of a large number of stories unknown outside a very small group of specialists. Apart from disagreement on the nose and lips, Betty's statement matches the description made by Barney of the shape of the head and the colour and appearance of the skin. Another remark by Betty is significant in this respect. I got the impression that the leader and the examiner were different from the crew members, but this is hard to say because I really didn't want to look at the men. Two other elements are outstanding in this case. One of them is the manner of communication with the strange beings. They communicated among themselves through an audible language, which was definitely not understandable to the witnesses. Yet when they communicated with the hills, their thoughts came through in English. Betty thinks that they spoke English with an accent, while Barney feels that the words and the presence of the entity were two separate things. Quote, I did not hear an actual voice, but in my mind I knew what he was saying. It wasn't as if he were talking to me with my eyes open and he was sitting across the room from me. It was more as if the words were there, a part of me, and he was outside the actual creation of the words themselves. End quote. This very remarkable statement an excellent description of the mechanism that triggered the communication may well be a clue to the entire episode, and it certainly places the case in the domain of the theory of apparitions, as it is treated, for instance, by Tyrrell in his celebrated 1942 Myers Lectures before the British Society for Psychical Research. Thus it is noteworthy that the apparent absurdity of the sequence of actions constituting the episode should be reducible to the triggering of high-level perception patterns within the witness's brain, and not necessarily through an actual normal physical process. And this characteristic in its turn is reminiscent both of neurophysiological experiments and of reports by the most reliable observers of ghosts. Although, of course, ghosts are distinguished from the class of phenomena we are studying here by the absence of material traces, which makes their interpretation a good deal simpler. And while it is probable that a complete theory of ghosts could confine the phenomena to parameters within the human nervous system, the same is not true of UFOs. For this reason, therefore, it is crucial to pursue the investigation of cases of apparitions in older times in relation to reports such as that of the hills. The recognition of a strong psychological, or psychic, if you prefer, component in UFO manifestations makes such a study imperative. If the phenomena are to be ascribed to psychological causes, then the causes must have manifested themselves during all epochs, although naturally sociologists could give various reasons to expect a considerable increase in such manifestations since World War II. On the other hand, if the phenomenon is not wholly psychological in nature, then the discovery of historical antecedents would be a valuable clue to its nature. The experiment performed on Betty Hill by the entities is therefore quite remarkable. It will be recalled that while she was in the craft, Betty was submitted to a simulated medical test. Under hypnosis, she reported that a long needle was inserted into her navel, that she felt pain, 
and that the pain stopped when the leader made a certain gesture with his hand in front of her eyes. A 15th century French calendar, the Calendria des Bergers, shows the tortures inflicted by demons on the people they have taken. The demons are depicted piercing their victims' abdomens with long needles. In fact, the psychological invariable in all these stories is unmistakable. The problem, then, is not to identify it, but to relate it in a rational manner to the physical features encountered during the observations. For example, the tracking by military radar operators of the UFO seen by the hills. Perhaps we should illustrate the difficulty of this problem by using a case that is less well known than the hills incident, though it is quite as dramatic. It has never appeared in English UFO literature and therefore cannot have influenced American UFO law. Even in France, it is practically unknown. The incident took place on May 20, 1950, at about 4 p.m. I cannot reveal the name of the witness or the exact location. I can say, however, that the witness was a woman and that the episode took place in the central region of France, near the Loire River. An official investigation by French local police has substantiated the physical traces mentioned in this report, which can be translated thus. Quote, I was hurrying back home to prepare dinner. I was happy and content and I was singing some popular tune. Everything was calm and still without any breeze or wind. I was alone on the path. Suddenly I found myself within a brilliant, blinding light and I saw two huge black hands appear in front of me. Each one had five fingers of a black color with a yellowish tint somewhat like copper. The fingers were roughly formed, slightly vibrating or quivering these hands did not come from behind me, but from above, as if they had been hanging over my head, awaiting the proper time to catch me. The black hands did not immediately apply themselves to my head. I probably took two or three steps before they touched me. The hands had no visible arms. The two black hands were applied to my face with violence and squeezed my head, as a bird of prey rushes on its unfortunate, helpless victim. They pulled my head back against a very hard chest one that seemed to be made of iron. I felt the cold through my hair and behind my neck, but no contact with clothes. The hands were squeezing my head like a formidable vice, not abruptly, but gradually. They were very cold, and their touch made me think that they were not made of flesh. The big fingers were placed on my eyes, and I could not see any more, on my nose so that I could not breathe, and also on my mouth to prevent me from crying out. When I was surrounded by the strong, blinding light, I had the feeling I had been paralyzed, and when the hands touched me, I had the very distinct impression of a strong electric discharge, as if I had been shaken by a lightning bolt. My whole body was annihilated, helpless, without reflexes. I was like a broken toy between the inhuman hands of my unknown aggressor. For a little over a minute, I felt his hands tightening very strongly on either side of my throat. It was horribly painful. Then he began to swing me forward and backward several times, still fiercely squeezing my head against his chest. I had the distinct impression that this being wore armour, or a steel carapace, or some very hard and cold material. I felt his two invisible arms pressing heavily on my shoulders. It was at that moment that I heard his laugh, a strange laugh I could not explain. It was as if I heard him through some water, and yet it seemed quite close above my head. At first it sounded rough and hushed, then rather strong and rolling. It made me shudder and hurt me. After a few seconds, the laugh stopped, suddenly cut off. Then a knee hit me in the back, hurting me very much, as if it were made of steel. That made me think my aggressor was completely covered with steel. This blow made me fall back, and the unknown aggressor made me lie down, still squeezing my head against his chest. Then he dragged me along the path by my head, and he seemed in a great hurry. I did not hear him breathe. He pulled me into a bush, full of brambles and nettles and acacias still going backward at an incredible speed, holding my head. At that moment I heard his voice above me, and it said, There she is! We've got her! As if he were talking to someone else, some accomplice who had stayed inside the bush. This voice, like the laugh, seemed close by, although hushed by some obstacle, and it was short, rough, sharply cut. I was choking, and I felt I was going to die. I thought of my family waiting for me at home, and my whole life passed before me in a few seconds. My aggressor pulled me through the bushes until we reached a small pasture, and suddenly he stopped. Why? His hands had gradually slipped down my face, and I tried to call for help, 
but I had no voice left but a tiny, shrill cry. After a while, I was able to sit among the brambles. I had a very hard time breathing. My bag was still in my hand, with the money it contained. At last, I was able to get up in spite of my weakness, and then I heard some noise to my left inside the bushes. I thought I was going to see my aggressors and recognize their faces, but I saw nothing. Only the branches moved, waving in the air. I saw and heard the brambles scratching the empty space, and the grass being pressed as if under the steps of some invisible being. I was terrified. Softly, I took to the path again, walking with difficulty. My legs were lacerated by the brambles and bleeding. I felt a strange sensation of nervous exhaustion, indefinable, as if I had been electrified by a strong current. In my mouth was a sickening, metallic, bitter taste. My muscles did not obey me. Over my shoulders, I felt something like a bar, and in my back a painful heat, as if I had been exposed to flames or to a burning ray. At times I still felt as if I was being brushed by an invisible brush. I must have walked like that for five or six minutes. At the end of the path there was a turn, and from there I could see houses, and then the pains decreased a little bit. Everything had lasted a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes, and it seemed that I had lived in an unreal world. Abruptly I heard a great noise, like a violent wind during a storm, a sudden displacement of warm air or a violent whirlwind. I saw the trees bending as if under a sudden storm, and I was nearly thrown down. Almost simultaneously, there was a strong, blinding white light. I had the feeling something flew through the air very fast, but I saw nothing. Soon everything became calm again. I felt discomfort and nausea. I reached the house of the lock keeper, and when I opened the door, they came toward me and asked me what had happened, because they too had seen a light from their house. The lock keeper's wife asked me what was wrong. When I was able to speak at last, they told me all the fingers were still deeply marked in the flesh of my face, making large red bars. They applied peroxide to the scratches on my legs and an ointment, and bathed my face with cold water. My hands were badly hurt. After a long lapse of time, I started again toward to buy a few things, without saying anything to anyone, and I came back home laboriously by another path. After I told my mother, and my father and my brother too, what had happened to me, they filed a complaint with the gendarmerie. The police came and interviewed me at length. They examined me and observed the marks of large fingers on my face. I was still swollen and felt pains at several places. They concluded there had been an abduction attempt and told me that it was very strange, mysterious. They took me to the spot to continue their investigation there. They noted that at some places the brambles were black and scorched. At some other places they were only pressed and flattened. The acacias, too, had been burned in places, and they were broken too. The fences in the pasture, which were made of wooden posts and barbed wire, had suffered also. Some posts were burned, others pulled out, the barbed wire had been wrenched away and broken, end quote. The previous day, May 19th, in the evening, the witness in this case had observed a kind of shooting star, which stopped abruptly, then appeared to go up and stay among the other stars for a while, then to grow bigger and take on a kind of swinging motion, its light alternately on and off. Suddenly it left on a curved trajectory and reached the horizon at very high speed. She had dismissed the incident from her mind at the time. The official investigation got nowhere and was dropped. The case is still carried as an unsolved abduction attempt. What can we say about such reports? They are neither more nor less believable than other UFO sightings. They are in line with some of the most dramatic stories of older days, which inspired the fairy tales. They are also in line, as we shall see, with the visions of the 1897 airship and the incidents that followed it. But it is too early to theorize. It is better at this time merely to inspect the documents though I must confess that I have previously regarded many such cases as worthless, even if their documentation is not inferior to that of the more believable cases we study. Take another abduction case, one that allegedly occurred on August 21, 1915. Quote, Gallipoli, August 28, 1915. The following is an account of a strange incident that happened in the morning during the severest and final days of the fighting which took place at Hill 60, Suvla Bay, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. The day broke clear, without a cloud in sight, 
as any beautiful Mediterranean day could be expected to be. The exception, however, was a number of perhaps six or eight loaf of bread shaped clouds, all shaped exactly alike, which were hovering over Hill 60. It was noticed that, in spite of a four or five mile an hour breeze from the south, these clouds did not alter their position in any shape or form, nor did they drift away under the influence of the breeze. They were hovering at an elevation of about 60 degrees, as seen from our observation point 500 feet up. Also stationary, and resting on the ground right underneath this group of clouds, was a similar cloud in shape, measuring about 800 feet in length, 200 feet in height, and 200 feet in width. This cloud was absolutely dense, almost solid looking in structure, and positioned about 14 to 18 chains from the fighting in British held territory. All this was observed by 22 men of number three section of number one field company, NZE, including myself, from our trenches on Rhododendron Spur, approximately 2,500 yards southwest of the cloud on the ground. Our vantage point was overlooking Hill 60 by about 300 feet. As it turned out later, this singular cloud was straddling a dry creek bed or sunken road, Kayajik Dere, and we had a perfect view of the cloud's sides and ends as it rested on the ground. Its color was a light gray, as was the color of the other clouds. A British regiment, the 1st 4th Norfolk, of several hundred men, was then noticed marching up this sunken road or creek towards Hill 60. It appeared as though they were going to reinforce the troops at Hill 60. However, when they arrived at this cloud, they marched straight into it, with no hesitation. But no one ever came out to deploy and fight at Hill 60. About an hour later, after the last of the file had disappeared into it, this cloud very unobtrusively lifted off the ground, and like any fog or cloud would, rose slowly until it joined the other similar clouds which were mentioned in the beginning of this account. On viewing them again, they all looked alike as peas in a pod. All this time the group of clouds had been hovering in the same place, but as soon as the singular ground cloud had risen to their level, they all moved away northwards, that is towards Thrace, Bulgaria. In a matter of about three quarters of an hour, they had all disappeared from view. The regiment mentioned is posted as missing or wiped out, and on Turkey surrendering. In 1918, the first thing Britain demanded of Turkey was the return of this regiment. Turkey replied that she had neither captured this regiment nor made contact with it and did not know that it existed. A British regiment in 1914 to 18 consisted of any number between 800 and 4,000 men. Those who observed this incident vouch for the fact that Turkey never captured that regiment, nor made contact with it. We, the undersigned, although late in time, that is at the 50th jubilee of the Anzac landing, declare that the above described incident is true in every word. Signed by witnesses, number 4165, Sapper, F. Reichart of Matata, Bay of Plenty, number 13416, Sapper, R. Nunes of 157 King Street, Cambridge, and J.L. Newman of 73 Freiburg Street, Otumoktai, Toranga, end quote. Taken by the wind, we have now examined several stories of abductions and attempts at kidnappings by the occupants of flying saucers. These episodes are an integral part of the total UFO problem and cannot be solved separately. Historical evidence gathered by Wentz, moreover, once more points in the same direction. Quote, this sort of belief in fairies being able to take people was very common and exists yet in a good many parts of West Ireland. The good people are often seen there, pointing to Knock Mug, in great crowds playing hurley and ball, and one often sees among them the young men and women and children who have been taken, end quote. Not only are people taken, but, as in flying saucer stories, they are sometimes carried to faraway spots by aerial means. Such a story is told by the prophet Ezekiel, of course, and by other religious writers. But an ordinary Irishman, John Campbell, also told Wentz, quote, A man whom I have seen, Roderick McNeil, was lifted by the hosts and left three miles from where he was taken up. The hosts went at about midnight, end quote. Reverend Kirk gives a few stories of similar extraordinary kidnappings, but the most fantastic legend of all is that attached to Kirk himself. The good reverend is commonly believed to have been taken by the fairies. Quote, Mrs. J. McGregor, who keeps the key to the old churchyard, where there is a tomb to Kirk, though many say there is nothing in it but a coffin filled with stones, 
told me Kirk was taken into the fairy knoll, which she pointed to just across a little valley in front of us, and is there yet, for the hill is full of caverns, and in them the good people have their homes. And she added that Kirk appeared to a relative of his after he was taken, end quote. Wentz, who reports this interesting story, made further inquiries regarding the circumstances of Kirk's death. He went to see the successor to Kirk in Aberfoyle, Reverend Taylor, who clarified the story. Quote, At the time of his disappearance, people said he was taken because the fairies were displeased with him for disclosing their secrets in so public a manner as he did. At all events, it seems likely that Kirk was taken ill very suddenly with something like apoplexy while on the fairy knoll and died there. I have searched the presbyter books and find no record of how Kirk's death really took place, but of course there is not the least doubt of his body being in the grave. End quote. Kirk believed in the ability of the good people to perform kidnappings and abductions, and this idea was so widespread that it has come down to us through a variety of channels. We can therefore examine in detail four aspects of fairy law that directly relate to our study. One, the conditions and purpose of the abductions. Two, the cases of release from Elfland and the forms taken by the elves' gratitude when the abducted human being had performed some valuable service during his stay in Elfland. Three, the belief in the kidnapping activities of the fairy people. And four, what I shall call the relativistic aspects of the trip to Elfland. Hartland reports that a Swedish book published in 1775 contains a legal statement, solemnly sworn on April 12, 1671, by the husband of a midwife who was taken to Fairyland to assist a troll's wife in giving birth to a child. The author of the statement seems to have been a clergyman named Peter Rahm. Quote, on the authority of this declaration, we are called on to believe that the event recorded actually happened in the year 1660. Peter Rahm alleges that he and his wife were at their farm one evening late, when there came a little man, swart of face and clad in grey, who begged the declarant's wife to come and help his wife then in labour. The declarant, seeing that they had to do with a troll, prayed over his wife, blessed her, and bade her in God's name go with the stranger. She seemed to be borne along by the wind." End quote. It is reported that she came home in the same manner, having refused any food offered to her while in the troll's company. In another tale, the midwife's husband accompanies her through the forest. They are guided by the Earthman, the gnome who has requested their help. They go through a moss door, then a wooden door, and later through a door of shining metal. A stairway leads them inside the earth to a magnificent chamber where the Earthwife is resting. Kirk reports that in a case whose principles he personally knew, the abducted woman found the home of the little people filled with light, although she could not see any lamp or fire. Reverend Kirk also says that later, in the company of another clergyman, he visited a woman, then 40 years old, and asked her questions concerning her knowledge of the fairies. It was rumoured that for a number of years she had taken almost no nourishment and that she often stayed very late in the fields looking after her sheep, that she met there and talked with people she did not know, and that one night she had fallen asleep on a hill and had been carried away into another place before sunrise. This woman, says Kirk, was always melancholy and silent. The physical nature of Magonia, as it appears in such tales, is quite noteworthy. Sometimes it is a remote country, an invisible island, some faraway place one can reach only by a long journey. Indeed, in some tales, it is a celestial country, as in the Indian story quoted earlier. This parallels the belief in the extraterrestrial origin of UFOs so popular today. A second, and equally widespread, theory is that Elfland constitutes a sort of parallel universe, which coexists with our own. It is made visible and tangible only to selected people, and the doors that lead through it are tangential points known only to the Elves. This is somewhat analogous to the theory, sometimes found in the UFO literature, concerning what some authors like to call the fourth dimension, although of course this expression makes much less physical sense than does the theory of a parallel Elfland. It does sound more scientific, however. Hartland gives tales that illustrate the theory of tangential universes, such as the following. Quote, in Nithsdale, a fairy rewards the kindness of a young mother, to whom she had committed her babe to suckle, by taking her on a visit to Fairyland. 
A door opened in a green hillside, disclosing a porch which the nurse and her conductor entered. There the lady dropped three drops of a precious dew on the nurse's left eyelid, and they were admitted to a beautiful land watered with meandering rivulets and yellow with corn, where the trees were laden with fruits which dropped honey. The nurse was here presented with magical gifts, and when a green dew had baptized her right eye, she was enabled to behold further wonders. On returning, the fairy passed her hand over the woman's eye and restored its natural powers." End quote. This tale brings us to our second point, that of the gratitude shown by the elves in return for services performed by humans, and the form such gratitude takes. The gratitude itself is evidenced by many stories of elvish gifts in Scandinavian and Northern European tales, such as this one. Quote, a German midwife, who was summoned by a waterman, or Nix, to aid a woman in labor, was told by the latter, I am a Christian woman as well as you, and I was carried off by a waterman who changed me. When my husband comes in now and offers you money, take no more from him than you usually get, or else he will twist your neck. Take good care. End quote. In another story, the midwife is asked how much she wants. She answers, she will not take more from them than from other people, and the elf replies, that's lucky for thee. Hadst thou demanded more, it would have gone ill with thee. In spite of that, she received her apron full of gold. In a Pomeranian story, the midwife similarly replies to the same question, and the mannequin says, now then, lift up thy apron and fills it with rubbish that lay in the corner of the room. He then takes his lantern and politely escorts her home. But when she shakes out her apron, pure gold falls on the floor. Elvish gifts have a magical character, which will take very special meaning in the next chapter. Their magical quality could be illustrated with tales from practically any country. Chinese folklore in particular gives numerous examples of it. In one tale, the dwarf fills the woman's apron with something she must not look at before she reaches her house. Naturally, she takes a look as soon as the dwarf has vanished and sees that she is carrying black coals. Angered, she throws them away, retaining two as evidence of the dwarf's bad treatment. She arrives home and discovers the black coals have turned into precious stones. But when she goes back to find the other coals, they are all gone. There are, in fact, numerous stories in folklore of humans who have gone to fairyland of their own will, either taking a message, or bringing one back, or performing some service for the supernatural beings who live there. But, and this is my third point, we also have numerous accounts of abductions by the fairies. They take men and women, especially pregnant women or young mothers, and they also are very active in stealing young children. Sometimes they substitute a false child for the real one, leaving in place of the real child a broom with rugs wrapped around it, or one of their children, a changeling. Quote, By the belief in changelings, I mean a belief that fairies and other imaginary beings are on the watch for young children, or sometimes even for adults that they may, if they can find them unguarded, seize and carry them off, leaving in their place one of them. End quote. This belief is not confined to Europe. It is found in regions as remote from Europe as China and the American Pacific coast. But in any case, once the parents have recognized their child has been taken, what should they do? Hartland says that a, quote, method in favor in the north of Scotland is to take the suspected elf to some known haunt of its race. Generally, we are told, some spot where peculiar sowing sounds are heard, or to some barrow or stone circle, and lay it down. An offering of bread, butter, milk, cheese, eggs and flesh or fowl must accompany the child, end quote. The parents then retire for an hour or two. If their gifts have vanished when they come back, then their own child will be returned. But sometimes more radical methods have been used and we can only pity the poor children who have been ill-treated because their superstitious parents thought they looked like elves. As late as May 17, 1884, it was reported in the London Daily Telegraph, two women were arrested at Clonmel and charged with cruelty toward a child three years old. They thought he was a changeling and, by ill-treating him, hoped to obtain the real child from the fairies. And there is no question that in medieval times the same superstition has led to the death of children who had congenital defects. Sometimes the same treatment applies to adults who have been changed. And Hartland gives a very funny example of such a case. Quote, 
A tale from Badenoch represents the man as discovering the fraud from finding his wife, a woman of unruffled temper, suddenly turned a shrew. So he piles up a great fire and threatens to throw the occupant of the bed upon it unless she tells him what has become of his own wife. She then confesses that the latter has been carried off and she has been appointed successor. But by his determination, he happily succeeds in recapturing his own at a certain fairy knoll near Inverness. End quote. Of course, the UFO myth has not yet reached such romantic proportions, but we are perhaps not quite far from it, at least in certain rural areas, where strange flying objects have become a source of terror to people traveling at night, and where the rumor that invaders might be around has gained interest, if not support. A recent television series has capitalized on this aspect of UFO lore. In the show, the human race has been infiltrated by extraterrestrials who differ from humans in small details only. This is not a new idea, as the belief in changelings shows. And there is a well-known passage in Martin Luther's Table Talk, in which he tells the Prince of Anhalt that he should throw into the Moldau a certain man who is, in his opinion, such a changeling or kill crop, as they were called in Germany. What was the purpose of such fairy abductions? The idea advanced by students of folktales is again very close to a current theory about UFOs, that the purpose of such contact is a genetic one. According to Hartland, quote, the motive assigned to fairies in Northern stories is that of preserving and improving their race, on the one hand by carrying off human children to be brought up among the elves and to become united with them, and on the other hand, by obtaining the milk and fostering care of human mothers for their own offspring, end quote. We shall see below what parallels can be found in recent UFO cases. However, such is not always the purpose of abduction, and people are often returned by the elves after nothing more than a dance or a game. But a strange phenomenon often takes place. The people who have spent a day in Elfland come back to this world one year or more older. This is our fourth point and quite a remarkable one. Time does not pass there as it does here, and we have in such stories the first idea of the relativity of time. How did this idea come to the storytellers ages ago? What inspired them? No one can answer such questions. But it is a fact that the dissymmetry of the time element between Elfland and our world is present in the tales from all countries. Discussing this supernatural lapse of time in fairyland, Hartland relates the true story of Rhys and Llewellyn, recorded about 1825 in the Vale of Neath, Wales. Rhys and Llewellyn were fellow servants to a farmer. As they went home one night, Rhys told his friend to stop and listen to the music. Llewellyn heard no music, but Rhys had to dance to the tune he had heard a hundred times. He begged Llewellyn to go ahead with the horses, saying that he would soon overtake him. But Llewellyn arrived home alone. The next day, he was suspected of murdering Rhys and jailed. But a farmer who was skilled in fairy matters guessed the truth. Several men gathered, among them the narrator of the story, and took Llewellyn to the spot where he said his companion had vanished. Suddenly, hush, cried Llewellyn, I hear music, I hear sweet harps. All listened, but could hear nothing. Llewellyn's foot was on the outer edge of the fairy ring. He told the narrator to place his foot on his, and then he too heard the sounds of many harps and saw a number of little people dancing in a circle 20 feet or so in diameter. After him, each of the party did the same and observed the same thing. Among the dancing little folk was Reese. Llewellyn caught him by his smock frock as he passed close to them and pulled him out of the circle. At once, Reese asked, where are the horses? And asked them to let him finish the dance, which had not lasted more than five minutes and he could never be persuaded of the time that had elapsed. He became melancholy, fell ill, and soon after died. Such stories can be found in Kitely's The Fairy Mythology and other books, although of course the story of Rhys and Llewellyn is remarkable because it dates from the 19th century, thus providing a measure of continuity between fairy and UFO lore. In the tales of this type, several modes of recovery of the persons taken are offered. One of them consists in touching the abducted man with a piece of iron, and the objection of supernatural beings to this metal is one of the themes of fairy lore. Near Bridgend, Wales, is a place where it is reported that a woman who had been taken by the fairies came back ten years later and thought she had not been away more than ten days. 
Hartland gives another charming story on the same theme concerning a boy named Gitto Bach, or Little Griffith, a farmer's son who disappeared. Quote, During two whole years nothing was heard of him, but at length one morning when his mother, who had long and bitterly mourned for him as dead, opened the door, whom should she see sitting on the threshold but Gitto with a bundle under his arm? He was dressed and looked exactly as when she last saw him, for he had not grown a bit. Where have you been all this time? asked his mother. Why, it was only yesterday I went away, he replied, and opening the bundle he showed her a dress the little children, as he called them, had given him for dancing with them. The dress was of white paper without seam. With maternal caution she put it into the fire. End quote. The best-known stories where time relativity is the main theme are, of course, of the Rip Van Winkle type, patterned after numerous folk stories that allegedly concern actual events. Strangely enough, we again find the identical theme in ages-old Chinese folklore. Witness the story of Wang Qi, one of the holy men of the Taoists. One day, as Wang Qi wandered through the mountains of Qichao gathering firewood, he saw a grotto where some old men were playing chess. He came in to watch their game and laid down his axe. One of the old men gave him something like a date stone and instructed him to place it on his mouth. No sooner had he done so than hunger and thirst passed away. Some time later, one of the aged players told him, It is long since you came here, you should go home now. But as he turned to pick up his axe, Wang Qi found that the handle had turned into dust. He reached the valley, but found not hours or days, but centuries had passed, and nothing remained of the world as he had known it. A similar tradition exists in Denmark. For instance, in a tale which is typical of the pattern, a bride thoughtlessly walked through the fields during the festivities of her wedding day and passed a mound where the elves were making merry. Again, we have here a description of the little people, close to the magical object sometimes described as a large, flat, round table, sometimes as a hillock. A disc or a large cone resting on the ground would fit that description. In describing the fairy knoll, Hartland writes, The hillock was standing, as is usual on such occasions, on red pillars. The wee folk offered the bride to be a cup of wine, and she joined in a dance with them. Then she hastened back home, where she could not find her family. Everything had changed in the village. Finally, on hearing her cries, a very old woman exclaimed, Was it you, then, who disappeared at my grandfather's brother's wedding a hundred years ago? At these words, the poor girl fell down and expired. It is fascinating indeed to find such tales, which antedate Einstein's and Langevin's relativistic traveller by centuries. The supernatural lapse of time in fairyland is often allied to the theme of love between the abducted human being and one of the fairies. Such is the pattern of the story of Ossian or Oshin. Once when he was a young man, Oshin fell asleep under a tree. He woke up suddenly and found a richly dressed lady of more than mortal beauty looking at him. She was the queen of the legendary land of Tirnanog, and she invited him to share her palace. Oshin and the queen were in love and happy, but the hero was warned not to go into the palace gardens or to stand on a certain flat stone. Naturally, he transgressed the order, and when he stood upon the stone, he beheld his native land, suffering from oppression and violence. He went to the queen and told her he must return. How long do you think you have been with me? She asked. Thrice seven days, said he. Thrice seven years, was the answer. But he still wanted to go back. She then gave him a black horse from whose back he must not alight during his trip in the other world, for fear of seeing the power of time suddenly fall on him. But he forgot the warning when an incident induced him to dismount, and at once he became a feeble, blind and helpless old man. It is not necessary to spend time here to point out in detail the parallel traditions of the island of Avalon, Morgan the Fay, the legend of Ogier the Dane, and the magical travels of King Arthur. All these traditions insist on the peculiar nature of time in the other world, nor is this limited to European history, as Hartland again points out. Quote, Many races having traditions of a culture god, that is, of a superior being who has taught them agriculture and the arts of life and led them to victory over their enemies, add that he has gone away from them for a while and that he will someday come back again. Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha, the culture gods of Mexico and Peru, are familiar instances of this, end quote. Similarly, Vishnu has yet a tenth incarnation to accomplish the final destruction of this world's wicked. 
At the end of the present age, he will be revealed in the sky, seated on a white horse and holding a blazing sword. Such great traditions are common knowledge, like the abductions of Enoch, Ezekiel, Elijah, and others in the Bible. What is not commonly known is that such legends have been built on the popular belief in numerous actual stories of the less glorious, more ordinary, and personal type we have reviewed here. For instance, while all the books about Mexico mention Quetzalcoatl, they usually ignore the local beliefs in little black beings, the Icals, whose pranks we have already mentioned, and who, while their relationship with modern Latin American UFO lore is clear, also provide an obvious parallel to the fairy faith. In his study of the tales of Tenejapa, Brian Stross reports, quote, They are believed to be beings from another world, and some have been seen flying with some kind of rocket-like thing attached to the back. With this rocket, they are said occasionally to have carried off people, end quote. Similarly, Gordon Crichton reports, quote, The Ikal of the Zotzils flies through the air. Sometimes he steals women, and the women so taken are remarkably prolific and may bear a child once a week or once a month or even daily. The offspring are black, and they learn the art of flying inside their father's cave, end quote. Brian Stress's Indian informants reported that a flurry of Icals was sighted about 20 years ago, which would take us back to 1947, a very important year in UFO history. On June 5, 1968, the press reported that a Buenos Aires couple, Mr. and Mrs. Vidal, had a very strange adventure while driving between Chascomas and Maipú. They were surrounded by a thick cloud of mist and fell asleep. When they woke up, their car was on a dirt road they did not know, and they found out to their dismay that they were in Mexico. The paint on their car, a Peugeot 403, had entirely vanished. The Vidals went to the Argentine consulate in Mexico, and from there called some friends of theirs in Buenos Aires to make arrangements for their return. The consulate has refused to comment on the incident. The Vidal's car has been taken to the United States for investigation, and Mrs. Vidal has been hospitalized in an Argentina clinic in a state of nervous depression. 48 hours in the lives of Mr. and Mrs. Vidal cannot be accounted for. Beyond Reason In the past 20 years, UFO reports have been studied not only in a sensational light by people with journalistic motives and methods, but also by serious persons who have tried to place them within the framework of space science, modern physics, psychology, or the history of superstition. An increasing number of researchers, best identified with the Flying Saucer Review in Great Britain and with the groups such as APRO and NICAP in the United States, have made systematic efforts at responsible data gathering, at the same time attempting to discover one or several consistent patterns in the reports. But these efforts at rationalization of the UFO phenomenon have so far failed. The most appealing of the theories proposed, which would regard the UFOs as probes from another planet, fall short of explaining the phenomena in their historical development. Present-day sources cannot be evaluated without reference to the 1897 airship or to earlier sightings of similar objects. Then, too, the theory of simple visitation must be combined with the assumption that the visitors know far more physics than we do. So much more, in fact, that an interpretation in terms of physical concepts known to us is bound to end up in failure and contradiction. A second major flaw in all the theories proposed so far is found in the description of the entities and their behavior. Any theory can account for some of these reports, but only at the expense of arbitrary rejection of a much larger group. The recognition of a parallel between UFO reports and the main themes of fairy lore is the first indication I have found that a way might exist out of this dilemma. And although it is still too early for us to pick up the scattered pieces of our old theories in a new attempt at explanation, I would like to conclude this chapter with a more precise review of the most difficult cases we have before us. Of the reasonable sightings, there is little that can be said. The real problem begins when we find witnesses who are typical of the average population and who tell a story that, though not inconsistent with the spectrum of UFO reports, still stands out because of a few specific details that are so unbelievable that our first reaction is to reject the entire story. The thought that the story must be disregarded because it is a challenge to our reason is a reaction I am very familiar with. 
and it has led me in the past to select for analysis only those sightings that seem amenable to scientific criticism. Similarly, major groups such as NICAP or APRO and the official investigators working for Project Blue Book have devised some more or less conscious standards for the automatic rejection of unbelievable stories. To be sure, many of these reports do deserve the crackpot label, but such stories are usually accompanied by numerous signs of the witness's lack of mental balance. But when no such psychological context is evident, we must appraise the story very carefully. October 12, 1963. It was raining hard between Monte Maiz and Isla Verde in Argentina, as Eugenio Douglas drove his truck loaded with coal along the road. Dawn was coming. Suddenly, Douglas saw a bright spot on the road ahead, like the headlights of an approaching vehicle, except that it was a single, blinding light. To avoid a collision, Douglas slowed down. The light became so intense he had to lower his head and move to the side. He stopped the truck and got out. The light had disappeared. Through the rain, Eugenio Douglas could now see a circular metallic craft about 35 feet high. An opening became visible, making a second area of light, less intense, and three figures appeared. They looked like men, but they were wearing strange headdresses with things like antennae attached to the headpieces. They were over 12 feet tall. There was nothing repulsive about the entities, said Douglas, but he was terribly scared. As soon as he was seen by the figures, a ray of red light flashed to the spot where he stood and burned him. Grabbing a revolver, he fired at the three entities and ran off toward Montemayes but the burning red light followed him as far as the village, where it interfered with the streetlights, turning them violet and green. Douglas could smell a pungent gas. The beauty and dramatic character of that scene is impressive, and in a screen illustration of the UFO saga, this is probably the sighting that would best carry its total meaning. Douglas ran to the first house and shouted for help. Rebus, the owner, had died the previous night, but his family gathered around the body, reported that at the same time they heard Douglas's call the candles in the room and the electric lights in the house turned green, and the same strange smell was noticed. They rushed to open the door. There was Douglas in the pouring rain, his overcoat over his head, and a gun in his hand. The streetlights had changed colour. It must have been one of the most fantastic scenes in the rich archives of ufology. Eugenio Douglas was taken to the police station, where the burns on his face and hands were clearly seen. The police, it turned out, had received a number of calls about the light's colour change, but they had attributed the change to irregularities in the local power plant, which, however, would hardly account for the change in the candle lights if that particular observation was not an illusion. Douglas was examined by a doctor, who stated the burns had been caused by a radiation similar to ultraviolet, According to Douglas, he had felt a burn when exposed to a red beam. When villagers went to the site where the truck was still parked, they found large footprints, nearly 20 inches long, but they were shortly afterward washed away by rain. In late August 1963, near the town of Sagrada Família Brazil, three boys, Fernando Eustagio, 11, his brother Ronaldo, 9, and a neighbor named Marcos, went into the Eustagio garden and started to draw water from the well. Suddenly they became aware of a hovering sphere above the trees. They could even see four or five rows of people inside the sphere. An opening under the sphere became visible and two light rays shot downward. A slender, ten-foot-tall being came down as if gliding on the two beams of light. He alighted in the garden and walked for twenty feet or so in an odd fashion. His back seemed stiff his legs were open and his arms outstretched. He swung his body from left to right as if trying to find his balance and then sat down on a rock. The three boys observed that the giant wore a transparent helmet and had in the middle of his forehead what they described as a dark eye. He wore tall boots, each of which was equipped with a strange triangular spike which made a peculiar impression in the soft ground and could be seen for several days afterward. His garment was shiny and had inflated as soon as the entity had touched the ground. The trousers seemed to be fastened tightly to the boots. He had a peculiar square pack on his chest, which emitted flashes of light in an intermittent manner. Inside the sphere, still hanging motionless above the garden, the three boys could see occupants behind control panels, turning knobs and flicking switches. 
When the giant in the garden made a motion as if to grab one of the boys, Fernando picked up a stone, only to find himself unable to do anything with it as the spaceman looked straight into his eyes. The giant then returned to the sphere, still using the light beams as an elevator, but holding his arms close to his body this time. The boys were no longer afraid, although they could not account for their new feeling. As the sphere left, they were sure the giant spaceman had not come to hurt them, and somehow, in the same irrational fashion, they knew he would come back again. In Brazil, six years earlier, an incident had taken place that has gained in UFO literature the place it certainly deserves, thanks to an excellent investigation by the late Professor Olavo Fontes of the National School of Medicine in Rio de Janeiro, who interviewed and examined the witness A. Villas Boas of São Francisco de Sal, Minas Gerais. On the night of October 5, 1957, Antonio and his brother went to bed about 11 p.m. The night was hot, and as he opened the window, Antonio saw a silvery light in the corral similar to the spot made by a powerful searchlight. Later that night, the two brothers observed the light was still there. Then it moved toward the house, sweeping the roof before going away. About 10 p.m. on October 14th, Antonio was plowing with his tractor when he saw a blinding white light at the northern end of the field. Every time Antonio tried to approach it, the light moved away. This happened about 20 times, though the light always appeared to wait for him. His second brother was watching the scene as Antonio finally gave up. The light simply vanished. The next evening, Antonio was alone at the same spot. The night was cold, clear, and starry. At 1 a.m. he saw something like a red star, which grew larger and became an egg-like bright object, which hovered above his tractor, then landed softly. Antonio tried to drive away, but the engine of the tractor died. He jumped down and took two steps, but someone caught his arm. After a short struggle, four men carried him inside the craft. The beings communicated among themselves in slowly emitted growls, unlike any sound the witness could reproduce, although they were neither high-pitched nor too low. In spite of his resistance, the creatures stripped him, washed his body with something like a wet sponge, and took him into another room through a strangely lettered door. It is not my purpose here to record all the details of the experience reported by Villas Boas. They have been adequately documented first in the Flying Saucer Review by Fontes and Creighton, and later by the Lorenzans, who provide a complete reprint of the testimony as recorded by Fontes and J. Martins, along with the professional opinion of Dr. Fontes after his medical examination of the witness in their book Flying Saucer Occupants. Fontes's conclusion that Villas Boa is not mentally unbalanced and that he is sincere in reporting his story is what prompts me to include the story here. And the story does provide a link between such tales as the story of Ossian and the general question of the genetic context of the UFO myth, which will be the object of the next section of this chapter. Antonio remained alone in the room for what seemed to him a very long time. When he heard a noise at the door, he turned and received a terrible shock. The door was open and a woman came in as naked as he was. Her hair was blonde, with a part in the centre. She had blue eyes, rather longer than round, slanted outward. Her nose was straight, her cheekbones prominent. Her face looked very wide, wider than that of an Indio native. It ended in a pointed chin. Her lips were very thin, nearly invisible in fact. Her ears were small but ordinary. She was much shorter than he was, her head only reaching his shoulder. She quickly made clear to him what the purpose of her visit was. Soon after, in fact, another man came in and beckoned to the woman, who, pointing to her belly, smiled, pointed at the sky, and followed the man out. The men came back with Antonio's clothes, then took him to a room where the other crew members were sitting, growling among themselves. The witness, who felt sure no harm would come to him now, carefully observed his surroundings. Among other things, all his remarks here are of interest, he noticed a box with a glass top that had the appearance of an alarm clock. The clock had one hand and several marks that would correspond to the three, six, nine and twelve of an ordinary clock. However, although time passed, the hand did not move, and Antonio concluded that it was no clock. The symbolism in this remark by Villas Bois is clear. We are reminded of the fairy tales quoted above, of the country where time does not pass, 
and of that great poet who had in his room a huge white clock without hands, bearing the word, it is later than you think. It is the poetic quality of such details in many UFO sightings that catches the attention in spite of the irrational or obviously absurd character of the tale and makes it so similar to a dream. Antonio must have thought so because he reflected that he must bring some evidence back and tried to steal the clock. At once, one of the men shoved him to the side angrily. This attempt to secure evidence is a constant feature of fairy tales, and we are also reminded of the efforts by Betty Hill to convince her captors to let her take a peculiar book she saw inside their craft. As in the Villas Boas incident, the men denied her the opportunity to convince the world that the experience had been real. At last, one of the men motioned Antonio to follow him to a circular platform. He was then given a detailed tour of the machine, taken to a metal ladder, and signaled to go down. Antonio watched all the details of the preparation for takeoff and observed the craft as it rose from the ground and flew away in a matter of seconds. He noticed that the time was 5.30. He had spent over four hours inside the strange machine. It must be noted that the witness volunteered information about the sighting in general terms when a notice appeared in a newspaper calling for UFO reports. He was extremely reluctant to discuss the more personal aspects of his experience and related them only when questioned with insistence by Fontes and Martins. Like Maurice Massey, Villa Boa suffered from excessive sleepiness for about a month after the incident. Demonialitas When folklore becomes degraded to a minor literary form, as the fairy faith was degraded to the fairy tales we know today, it naturally loses much of its content precisely those adult details that cannot be allowed to remain in children's books. The direct result of the censorship of spicy details in these marvellous stories is that they really become mere occasions for amazement. The Villa Boas case is hardly appropriate for nursery school reading, but to eliminate the little lady from the story would turn it into a tale without deep symbolic or psychological value. The sexual context is precisely what gives such accounts their literary influence. It is what provides impact to the fairy faith. Without the sexual context, without the stories of changelings, human midwives, intermarriage with the gentry, of which we never hear in modern fairy tales, it is doubtful that the tradition about fairies would have survived through the ages. Nor is that true only of fairies. The most remarkable cases of sexual contact with non-humans are not found in spicy saucer books, nor in fairy legends. They rest safely stored away in the archives of the Catholic Church. To find them, one must first learn Latin and gain entrance into the few libraries where these unique records are preserved. But the accounts one finds there make the Villas Boa case pale by comparison, as I believe the reader will agree before the end of this chapter. Let us first establish clearly that the belief in the possibility of intermarriage between man and the non-human races we are studying is a corollary to the apparitions in all historical contexts. This is so obvious in biblical stories that I hardly need elaborate. The sex of the angels is not the most difficult. On the contrary, it is the clearest of all theological questions. In Anatole France's Revolt of the Angels, it is Arcade, one of the celestial beings, who says, quote, there's nothing like having sound references. In order to assure yourself that I am not deceiving you, Morris, on this subject of the amorous embraces of angels and women, look up Justin, Apologies 1 and 2, Flavins Josephus, Jewish Antiquities, Book 1, Chapter 3, Athenagoras Concerning the Resurrection, Lactantius, Book 2, Chapter 15, Tertullian, On the Veil of the Virgins, Marcus of Ephesus in Cellus, Eusebius, Preparatio Evangelica, Book 5, Chapter 4. St. Ambrose in his book on Noah and the Ark, chapter 5, St. Augustine in his City of God, book 15, chapter 23, Father Meldonat the Jesuit, Treatise on Demons, page 248. End quote. Thus spoke Arcade, his guardian angel, to poor Maurice, as he tried to apologize for having stolen his mistress, pretty Madame Gilbert. And he added shamelessly, quote, It was bound to be so. All the other angels in revolt would have done as I did with Gilbert. Women, saith the Apostle, should pray with their heads covered because of the angels, end quote. This is clear enough. But fairies and elves, are they subject to such carnal desires? Consider the following facts. 
In the preface of the Saga of Hrolf, Torfeus, a 17th century Danish historian, records statements made about the elves by Einard Guzmund, the Icelandic scholar. Quote, I am convinced they really do exist, and they are creatures of God, that they get married like we do, and have children of either sex. We have a proof of this in what we know of the love of some of their women with simple mortals. End quote. William Grant Stewart, in the popular superstitions and festive amusements of the Highlanders of Scotland, devotes the second part of his discussion to fairies. In a chapter entitled, Of the Passions and Propensities of the Fairies, he has this to say on sexual intercourse with them. Quote, The fairies are remarkable for the amorousness of their dispositions, and are not very backward in forming attachments and connections with the people that cannot with propriety be called their own species. End quote. This is a beautiful example of convoluted phraseology. Stuart is less obviously embarrassed when he reports that such events no longer seem to take place between men and fairies. Quote, we owe it, in justice to both the human and the fairy communities of the present day, to say that such intercourse as that described to have taken place betwixt them is now extremely rare. With the single exception of a good old shoemaker, now or lately living in the village of Tomantul, who confesses having had some dalliances with a Lannanshire in his younger days, we do not know personally anyone who has carried matters this length." End quote. If Stuart came back today, he would have to revise this statement after reading UFO material. Kirk stated the case more clearly when he said, In our Scotland there are numerous and beautiful creatures of that aerial order who frequently assign meetings to lascivious young men as succubi, or as joyous mistresses and prostitutes, who are called Lian and Sith, or familiar spirits. I hardly need to remind the reader of the importance of such familiar spirits in medieval occultism, particularly in Rosicrucian theories. Nor do I need to mention the number of accused witches who were condemned to death on the evidence that they had such familiar spirits. There is no gap between the fairy faith and ufology regarding the sexual question. This is apparent from the study made by Wentz, who records, for example, the following story. Quote, My grandmother, Catherine McInnes, used to tell about a man named Laughlin, whom she knew being in love with a fairy woman. The fairy woman made it a point to see Laughlin every night, and he being worn out with her began to fear her. Things got so bad at last that he decided to go to America to escape the fairy woman. As soon as the plan was fixed and he was about to emigrate, women who were milking at sunset out in the meadows heard very audibly the fairy woman singing this song. What will the brown-haired woman do when Lockie is on the billows? Lockie emigrated to Cape Breton, landing at Pictou, Nova Scotia. And in his first letter home to his friends, he stated that the same fairy woman was haunting him there in America, end quote. The comments by Wentz on this case are extremely important. Quote, to discover a tale so rare and curious as this is certainly of all our evidence highly interesting. And aside from its high literary value, it proves conclusively that the fairy women who entice mortals to their love in modem times are much the same, if not the same, as the succubi of middle-age mystics." End quote. This allows us to return to the religious records mentioned above, one of which offers one of the most remarkable cases of apparition I have ever come across. It is difficult to believe that stories exist that surpass, for their amazing contents or shocking features, some of the reports we have already studied, such as the Hills case or the Villas Boas report. But remarkable as they are, these latter two accounts refer only to one aspect of the total phenomenon. They can be interpreted only after being placed within the continuum of hundreds of lesser-known cases which provide the necessary background. The following case stands alone, and it is unique in that it relates the apparition of an incubus with the poltergeist phenomenon. The authority upon which the case rests is that of Friar Ludovicus Maria Sinistrari de Ameno, who reports and discusses it in his manuscript De Demonialitate et Incubis et Succubis, written in the second half of the 17th century. Who is Friar Sinistrari? A theologian scholar born in Ameno, Italy on February 26, 1622, he studied in Pavia and entered the Franciscan order in 1647. He devoted his life to teaching philosophy and theology to numerous students attracted to Pavia by his fame as an eminent scholar. He also served as counsellor to the Supreme Tribunal of the Inquisition 
and as theologian attached to the Archbishop of Milan. In 1688, he supervised the compilation of the statutes of the Franciscan order. He died in 1701. Among other books, Friar Sinistrari published a treatise called De Delictis et Puenis, which is an exhaustive compilation, Tractatus Absolutissimus, of all the crimes and sins imaginable. In short, Friar Sinistrari was one of the highest authorities on human psychology and religious law to serve the Catholic Church in the 17th century. Compared to his De Demonialitate, Playboy is a rather innocent gathering of mild reveries. The good friar writes, quote, about 25 years ago, while I was a professor of sacred theology at the Holy Cross Convent in Pavia, there lived in that city a married woman of excellent morality. All who knew her, and particularly the clergy, had nothing but the highest praises for her. Her name was Hieronima, and she lived in the St. Michael Parish. One day Hieronima prepared some bread and brought it to the bakers to have it baked. He brought it back to her, and at the same time he brought her a large pancake of a very peculiar shape made with butter and Venetian pastes, such as they use to make cakes in that city. She refused it, saying she had not prepared anything like it. But, said the baker, I have not had any bread to bake today but yours. The pancake must come from your house too. Your memory probably fails you. The good lady allowed herself to be convinced. She took the pancake and ate it with her husband, her three-year-old daughter, and a servant girl. During the following night, while she was in bed with her husband and both were asleep, she found herself awakened by an extremely fine voice, somewhat like a high-pitched whistling sound. It was softly saying in her ear some very clear words, How did you like the cake? In fear, our good lady began to use the sign of the cross and to invoke in succession the names of Jesus and Mary. Fear naught, said the voice. I mean no harm to you. On the contrary, there is nothing I would not do in order to please you. I am in love with your beauty, and my greatest desire is to enjoy your embraces. At the same time, she felt that someone was kissing her cheeks, but so softly and gently that she might have thought it was only the finest cotton down touching her. She resisted without answering anything, only repeating many times the names of Jesus and Mary and making the sign of the cross. The temptation lasted thus about half an hour, after which time the tempter went away. In the morning, the lady went to her confessor, a wise and knowledgeable man who confirmed her in the ways of the faith and appealed to her to continue her strong resistance and to use some holy relics. The following nights, similar temptations with words and kisses of the same kind, similar opposition too from the lady. However, as she was tired of such lasting trials, she took the advice of her confessor and other serious men and asked to be examined by trained exorcists to decide whether or not she was possessed. The exorcists found nothing in her to indicate the presence of the evil spirit. They blessed the house, the bedroom, the bed, and gave the incubus orders to discontinue his importunities. All was in vain. He went on tempting her, pretending he was dying with love, and crying, moaning, in order to invoke the lady's pity. With God's help, she remained unmoved. Then the incubus used a different approach. He appeared to her in the figure of a young boy or small man, with golden curling hair, with a blonde beard gleaming like gold and sea-green eyes. To add to his power of seduction, he was elegantly dressed in Spanish vestments. Besides, he kept appearing to her even when she was in company. He would complain as lovers do, he would send her kisses. In a word, he used all the means of seduction to obtain her favours. Only she saw and heard him, to all others there was nothing. This excellent woman had kept her unwavering determination for several months when the incubus had recourse to a new kind of persecution. First he took from her a silver cross full of holy relics, and a blessed wax or papal iamb of Pope Pius V, which she always had on her. Then, rings and other jewels of gold and silver followed. He stole them without touching the locks of the casket in which they were enclosed. Then he began to strike her cruelly, and after each series of blows one could see on her face, arm or other areas of her body bruises and marks, which lasted one or two days, then vanished suddenly, quite unlike natural bruises, which go away by degrees. Sometimes, as she suckled her daughter, he took the child from her knees and carried her to the roof, placing her at the edge of the gutter, or else he would hide her, but without ever causing her harm. 
He would also upset the household, sometimes breaking to pieces the plates and earthenware, but in the blink of an eye he also restored them to their original state. One night, as she lay in bed with her husband, the incubus, appearing to her under his usual form, energetically demanded that she give herself up. She refused, as usual. Furious, the incubus went away, and a short time later he returned with an enormous load of those flat stones that inhabitants of Genoa and of Liguria in general used to cover their houses. With these stones he built around the bed such a high wall that it reached almost to the ceiling, and the couple had to send for a ladder in order to come out. This wall was built without lime, it was pulled down and the stones were stored in a coma, where they were exposed to everyone's sight. But after two days, they vanished. On the day of St. Stephen, the lady's husband had invited several military friends to dine with him. To honour his guests, he had prepared a respectable dinner. While they were washing their hands, according to the custom, hop, suddenly the table vanished, along with the dishes, the cauldrons, the plates, and all the earthenware in the kitchen, the jugs, the bottles, the glasses too. You can imagine the amazement, the surprise of the guests. There were eight of them, among them a Spanish infantry captain who told them, do not be afraid, it is only a trick, but there used to be a table here, and it must still be here, I am going to find it. Having said that, he went around the room with outstretched hands, attempting to seize the table. But after he had made many turns, seeing he was only touching air, the others laughed at him, and since dinner time had passed, everyone took his coat and started for home. They had already reached the door with the husband, who was politely accompanying them, when they heard a great noise in the dining room. They stopped to find out what it was, and the servant girl ran and told them the kitchen was full of new plates loaded with food, and the table had come back in the dining room. The table was now covered with napkins, dishes, glasses and silverware that were not the original ones, and there were all kinds of precious cups full with rare wines. In the kitchen, too, there were new jugs and utensils they had never been seen there before. The guests, however, were hungry, and they ate this strange meal, which they found very much to their taste. After dinner, as they were talking by the fireplace, everything vanished, and the old table came back with the untouched dishes on it. But oddly enough, no one was hungry any longer, so that nobody wanted to have supper after such a magnificent dinner, which shows that the dishes which had been substituted for the original ones were real and not imaginary. This persecution had been going on for several months, the lady consulted the Blessed Bernardino of Felter, whose body is the object of veneration in St. James Church, some distance outside the city walls, and at the same time she vowed to wear for a whole year a grey monk's gown with a rope as a belt, like those used by the minor brothers in the order to which Bernardino belonged. She hoped through his intercession that she would be freed from the persecutions of the incubus, Indeed, on September 28th, which is the vigil of the dedication of Archangel St. Michael and the feast of the Blessed Bernardino, she took the votive dress. The next morning was the feast of St. Michael. Our afflicted lady went to the church of that saint, which was, as I have said, her own parish. It was about ten o'clock, and a very large crowd was going to Mass. Now, the poor woman had no sooner put her foot on the church ground than all of a sudden her vestments and ornaments fell to the ground and were carried away by the wind, leaving her as naked as the hand. Very fortunately, it so happened that among the crowd were two knights of mature age who saw the thing and hurriedly removed their coats to hide as well as they could that woman's nudity, and having put her in a coach, they drove her home. As for the vestments and jewels stolen by the incubus, he returned them six months later. To make a long story short, although there are many other tricks that this incubus played on her, and some amazing ones, suffice it to say that he kept tempting her for many years. But, at last, perceiving he was wasting his efforts, he discontinued these unusual and bothersome vexations." End quote. As a theologian, Friar Sinistrari was as puzzled by such reports as most modern students of UFO law are by the Villasboa case. Observing that the fundamental texts of the Church gave no clear opinion on such cases, Sinistrari wondered how they should be judged by religious law. A great part of his manuscript is devoted to a detailed examination of this question. The lady in the above example did not allow the incubus to have intercourse with her, 
but there are numerous other cases in the records of the church, especially in witch trials in which there was intercourse. From the church's point of view, says Friar Sinistrari, there are several problems. First, how is such intercourse physically possible? Second, how does demoniality differ from bestiality? Third, what sin is committed by those who engage in such intercourse? Fourth, what should their punishment be? The earliest author who uses the word demonialitas is J. Caramuel in his Theologia Fundamentalis. Before him, no one made a distinction between demoniality and bestiality. All the moralists, following St. Thomas Aquinas, understood by bestiality any kind of carnal intercourse with an object of a different species. Thus, Cajetan, in his commentary on St. Thomas, places intercourse with the demon in the class of bestiality, and so does Sylvester when he defines luxuria, and Bonacina in De Matrimonio, question 4. There is here a fine point of theology, which Sinistrari debates with obvious authority. He concludes that St. Thomas never meant intercourse with demons to fall within his definition of bestiality. By different species, Sinistrari says, the saint can only mean species of living being, and this hardly applies to the devil. Similarly, if a man copulates with a corpse, this is not bestiality, especially according to the Thomist doctrine that denies the corpse the nature of the human body. The same would be true for a man who copulates with the corpse of an animal. Throughout this discussion, the great intelligence and obvious knowledge of human psychology of the author is remarkable. It is quite fascinating to follow Friar Sinistrari's thoughts in an area that is directly relevant to UFO reports. And relevant it is indeed, for Villas Boas or Betty and Barney Hill would certainly have had a hard time before the Inquisitors if they had lived in the 17th century. The act of love, writes Sinistrari, has for an object human generation. Unnatural semination, that is, intercourse that cannot be followed by generation, constitutes a separate type of sin against nature. But it is the subject of that semination that distinguishes the various sins under that type. If demoniality and bestiality were in the same category, a man who had copulated with a demon could simply tell his confessor, I have committed the sin of bestiality. And yet he obviously has not committed that sin. Considerable problems arose, however, when one had to identify the physical process of intercourse with demons. This is clearly a most difficult point, as difficult as that of identifying the physical nature of flying saucers. And Sinistrari gives a remarkable discussion of it, pointing out that the main object of the discussion is to determine the degree of punishment these sins deserve. He tries to list all the different ways in which the sin of demoniality can be committed. First, he remarks, quote, there are quite a few people overinflated with their little knowledge, who dare deny what the wisest authors have written, and what everyday experience demonstrates, namely that the demon, either incubus or succubus, has carnal union not only with men and women, but also with animals." End quote. Sinistrari does not deny that some young women often have visions and imagine that they have attended a sabbat. Similarly, Ordinary erotic dreams have been classified by the Church quite separately from the question we are studying. Sinistrari does not mean such psychological phenomena when he speaks of demoniality. He refers to actual physical intercourse, such as the basic texts on witchcraft discuss. Thus, in the Compendium Maleficarum, Nacius gives 18 case histories of witches who have had carnal contact with demons. All cases are vouched for by scholars whose testimony is above question. Besides, St. Augustine himself says in no uncertain terms, quote, It is a widespread opinion, confirmed by direct or indirect testimony of trustworthy persons, that the sylvans and fauns, commonly called incubi, have often tormented women, solicited and obtained intercourse with them. There are even demons, which are called douzes, that is, litins, by the Gauls, who are quite frequently using such impure practices. This is vouched for by so numerous and so high authorities that it would be impudent to deny it." End quote. Now the devil makes use of two ways in these carnal contacts. One he uses with sorcerers and witches, the other with men and women perfectly foreign to witchcraft. This is a point of paramount importance. What Sinistrari is saying is that two kinds of people may come in contact with the beings he calls demons, those who have made a formal pact with them, and he gives the details of the process for making this pact 
and those who simply happen to be contacted by them. The implications of this fundamental statement to occultism for the interpretation of the fairy faith and of modern UFO stories should be obvious to the reader. The devil does not have a body. Then how does he manage to have intercourse with men and women? How can women have children from such unions if they specifically express the desire? All the theologians answer that the devil borrows the corpse of a human being, either male or female, or else he forms with other materials a new body for this purpose. Indeed, we find here the same theory as that expressed by one of the gentry and quoted by Wentz. We can make the old young, the big small, the small big. The devil then is said to proceed in one of two ways. Either he first takes the form of a female succubus and then has intercourse with a man or else the succubus induces lascivious dreams in a sleeping man and makes use of the resulting pollution to allow the devil to perform the second part of the operation. This is the theory taught by Nacius, who gives a great number of examples. Likewise, Hector Boethius, in Historia Scotorum, documents the case of a young Scot who for several months was visited in his bedroom, the windows and doors of which were closed by a succubus of the most ravishing beauty. She did everything she could to obtain intercourse with him, but he did not yield to her caresses and entreaties. One point intrigued Sinistrari greatly. Such demons do not obey the exorcists. They have no fear of relics and other holy objects, and thus they do not fall into the same category as the devils by which people are possessed, as the story quoted above certain shows. But then, are they really creatures of the devil? Should not we place them in a separate category, with the fairies and the elementals they so closely resemble? And then, if such creatures have their own bodies, does the traditional theory that incubi and succubi are demons who have borrowed human corpses hold? Could it explain how children are born from such unions? What are the physical characters of such children? If we admit that the UFO reports we have quoted earlier in this chapter indicate the phenomenon has genetic contents, then the above questions are fundamental, and it is important to see how Sinistrari understood them. Therefore, I give in the following a complete translation of his discussion of the matter. Quote, to theologians and philosophers, it is a fact that from the copulation of humans, man or woman with the demon, human beings are sometimes born. It is by this process that Antichrist must be born, according to a number of doctors, Bellamin, Suarez, Maluenda, etc. Besides, they observe that as the result of a quite natural cause, the children generated in this manner by the incubi are tall, very strong, very daring, very magnificent, and very wicked. Maluenda confirms what has been said above, proving by the testimony of various classical authors that it is to such unions that the following owe their birth. Romulus and Remus, according to Livy and Plutarch, Servius Tullius, sixth king of the Romans, according to Denise of Halicarnassus and Pliny. Plato the philosopher, according to Diogenes Laertius and St. Jerome. Alexander the Great, according to Plutarch and Quint Curse. Seleucus, king of Syria, according to Justin and Appian. Scipio the African, according to Livy. The emperor Caesar Augustus, according to Suetonius. Aristomenes of Messenia, the illustrious Greek general, according to Strabo and Pausanias. Let us add the English Merlin, or Melchin, born of an incubus and a nun, the daughter of Charlemagne. And finally, as writes Cochleus, quoted by Maluenda, that damned heresiarch whose name is Martin Luther. However, in spite of all the respect I owe so many great doctors, I do not see how their opinion can stand examination. Indeed, as Pererius observes very well in Commentary on Genesis, Chapter 6, all the strength, all the power of the human sperm comes from spirits that evaporate and vanish as soon as they issue from the genital cavities where they were warmly stored. The physicians agree on this. Therefore, it is not possible for the demon to keep the sperm he has received in a sufficient state of integrity to produce generation. For no matter what the vessel where he could attempt to keep it is, this vessel would have to have a temperature equal to the natural temperature of human genital organs, which is found nowhere but in those same organs. Now, in a vessel where the warmth is not natural but artificial, spirits are resolved, and no generation is possible. 
A second objection is that generation is a vital act through which man, from his own substance, introduces sperm through the use of natural organs into a place proper for generation. To the contrary, in the special case we are now considering, the introduction of the sperm cannot be a vital act of the generating man, since it is not by him that it is introduced into the matrix. And for the same reason, it cannot be said that the man to whom the sperm belonged has engendered the fetus that is procreated. Neither can we consider the incubus as the father, since the sperm is not of his own substance. Thus here is a child who is born and has no father, which is absurd. Third objection. When the father engenders naturally, there is a concourse of two causalities. A material one, for he provides the sperm that is the material of generation, and an efficient one, for he is the main agent in the generation, according to the common opinion of philosophers. But in our case, the man who does nothing but provide the sperm simply gives material, without any action tending toward generation. Therefore he could not be regarded as the child's father, and this is contrary to the notion that the child engendered by an incubus is not his child, but the child of the man whose sperm was borrowed by the incubus. We also read in the scriptures Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, that giants were born as a result of intercourse between the sons of God and the daughters of man. This is the very letter of the sacred text. Now, these giants were men of tall stature, as it is said in Baruch chapter 3, verse 26, and far superior to other men. Besides their monstrous size, they called attention by their strength, their plunders, their tyranny, and it is to the crimes of these giants that we must attribute the main and primary cause of the flood, according to Cornelius Alapide in his commentary on Genesis. Some state that under the name of sons of God we must understand the sons of Seth, and under that of daughters of men, the daughters of Cain, because the former practiced piety, religion, and all other virtues, while the latter, the children of Cain, did exactly the opposite. But with all the respect we owe Chrysostom, Cyril, and others who share this view, it will be recognized it is in disagreement with the obvious meaning of the text. What do the scriptures say? that from the conjunction of the above were born men of monstrous corporeal proportions. Therefore, these giants did not exist previously, and if their birth was the result of that union, it is not admissible to attribute it to the intercourse between the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain, who of ordinary size themselves could have children only of ordinary size. Consequently, if the intercourse in question has given birth to beings of monstrous proportions, we must see they're not the ordinary intercourse of men with women, but the operation of the incubi who, owing to their nature, can very well be called sons of God. This opinion is that of the Platonist philosophers and of Francois George of Venice, and it is not in contradiction with that of Josephus the historian, Philo, Saint Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, according to whom these incubi could be angels, who had allowed themselves to commit the sin of luxury with women. Indeed, as we shall show, there is nothing there but a single opinion under a double appearance." End quote. What we have here is a complete theory of contact between our race and another race, non-human, different in physical nature, but biologically compatible with us. Angels, demons, fairies, creatures from heaven, hell, or Magonia. They inspire our strangest dreams, shape our destinies, steal our desires, but who are they?